Three spaceflight veterans make up the crew of Expedition 5556. Drew Feustel from Lake Orion, Michigan, was selected by NASA in 2000. He has a PhD in the geological sciences and is a veteran of two spaceflights. In 2009, Feustel flew on the final mission to service the Hubble Space Telescope. He also served on STS-134 to deliver the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer to the International Space Station on the final flight of Space Shuttle Endeavour in 2011. This will be Feustel's second visit to the space station. Maryland native Ricky Arnold was selected as an astronaut in 2004. While on board the station during the STS-119 mission in 2009, he conducted 12 hours and 34 minutes worth of spacewalks. Before he joined NASA, Arnold worked in the marine sciences and as a teacher. The former teacher will continue NASA's Year of Education on Station program, bringing space into the classroom. Cosmonaut Oleg Artemyev returns to the space station where he spent 169 days during Expedition 39 and 40 from 2013 to 2014. The Riga Latvia native graduated from Bauman Moscow State Technical University with a degree in low temperature technology and physics. Drew, Ricky and Oleg will launch to the International Space Station in March. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us here at NASA's Johnson Space Center. You just saw a video introducing our crew for Expeditions 55 and 56. We're excited to be with them here today to learn more about their mission. Um, they will be launching to the International Space Station from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan on March 9th at 4.22 p.m. Central Time. Next to me, we have NASA astronaut Drew Feustel. It's Drew's third space flight, and he will be a flight engineer on Expedition 55 and the commander of Expedition 56. Next to him, we have NASA astronaut Ricky Arnold. It's his second space flight, and he will be a flight engineer on Expeditions 55 and 56. And then Oleg Artemyev, a Russian cosmonaut from um, Roscosmos, he will be a flight engineer for Expedition 55 and 56, and it's also his second space flight. Before we get started, I want to recognize some special guests we have here in the room. We have some pre-service science teachers from the University of Houston um, who have been selected to help develop experiments that will be um, used on the space station. They are part of our year of education on station, which you will hear more about in just a little bit. We also have some representatives from Keels and Wheels, a local Houston organization um, that runs a vintage bar car and boat show. So we'll have Drew talk a little bit more about his connection with cars and racing um, in a moment as well. First, let's have Drew, Ricky, and Oleg talk a little bit about their mission um, that they have been training for, and then we'll take questions for them. With that, let me turn to Drew Feustel. Drew, can you please talk about the mission from your perspective? Thanks, Megan. Um, I just want to say thanks to everybody for coming out today and joining us and allowing us some time to share with you, you know, our thoughts on the mission and preparation. Uh, we're all excited to be here. We couldn't have asked for a better crew to come together. Um, the time has been exciting over the last year and a half, almost two years in preparation for the flight. Right now we're finishing up all of our uh, training here in, in Houston and look forward to returning back to Russia early in the year to finish out the last few weeks there, and then we'll head off to Baikonur and get ready for launch. But um, something that wasn't mentioned at the beginning is uh, that Oleg, in addition to being a flight engineer, is also our commander on the Soyuz. So um, we're excited to have him. He's, he's a great leader uh, for us in the capsule. And I know for Ricky and I, former shuttle veterans, uh, this is going to be really exciting, and we finally get a chance to live on the space station. Yeah, that's a good point. So um, Drew and Ricky, you both have gone to space a couple of times on the space shuttle, but you haven't lived long duration on the on the space station. Oleg, you have um, done a long duration mission before, so this will be your second. Um, Drew, can you talk a little bit about your relation with cars, your interest there? Yeah, it's a long story, so I don't know <laughs> if we have time to talk about all of it. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, I grew up in Detroit, Michigan, and uh, as many of you may know, we call that the Motor City because, of course, the big three automakers were there. And I grew up around cars and automobiles and racing and started racing at a young age and, and restoring cars and have continued that throughout my lifetime. So that's one of my strong interests and worked as a mechanic while I went to community college. And uh, so I, I brought those skills with me into the astronaut corps and they've served me well. And we see a lot of astronauts uh, every day, the work that they do on the space station uh, involves uh, repair and 
uh, replacement of components in space and, and work on payloads and uh, just general operations really require a lot of that, those uh, mechanical aptitude skills. So it's been helpful for me and I'm trying to, I hope with the mission, um, excite uh, kids, youth around the world to consider um, that careers in uh, technical fields or apprentice fields are very useful and may actually lead you to space one day if you uh, pursue your, your dreams. So uh, it worked for me. Very good, thank you. All right, Ricky, can you tell us a little bit about the mission? What are you looking forward to? Thanks, Megan. Uh, yeah, thanks for coming out today and uh, braving the weather. Um, I know that at some point during the mission, we're gonna miss weather, but I'm not sure we're gonna miss <laughs> weather like we have here today, so, so thanks for coming out. Uh, like, like Drew, uh, we had the opportunity, the privilege to go up and help, help build the space station. Uh, on STS-119, when we installed the last set, set of solar arrays, provided enough power to actually take the space station to a crew of six. So to now be able to go up there and, and with this crew and join a, a multinational crew on the space station and live there uh, for, for five, six months is just a, it's a real honor and kind of a, a dream come true. Um, the, uh, the work we'll do up there uh, to improve life here on Earth and also to lay the, the foundation for the exploration of, of our solar system it's, it's really rewarding, and the people we get to do it with make it, uh, make it even more so. Um, I'm ex particularly excited about the continuing utilization of the, uh, the space station uh, as a platform for education. And so I'm really glad to have some pre-service teachers here. You're, you're really the backbone of, the, uh, of our education system. And um, it's, it's thrilling to see, to see people uh, still excited about what we're doing and, and working with the next generation of explorers and engineers and scientists that that make this, this great uh, journey of ours uh, possible. So thanks for coming. Great, and I'll just, I'll add to that that um, Ricky is a former classroom teacher and currently on the space station we have Joe Acaba um, currently living and working on the space station who's also a former classroom teacher. Correct. So because of that we are um, emphasizing education on the space station with our year of education in space. Um, and so Ricky will be following, following Joe and um, being able to provide some of those resources to educators. So we're excited for that. And we got to speak to Joe this morning so he also expressed a to pass along a hello to, to all the teachers here and those that, that tune in. All right, thanks, Ricky. Certainly. Oleg, you have um, spent a long duration mission on the space station. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're looking forward to for this mission? Спасибо за вопрос. Я жду очень интересной и очень нужной работы для нас, для всех и Я надеюсь, что мы нашим учителям, нашим инструкторам не будет стыдно за нашу работу. И я думаю, что эта работа будет шагом все-таки вперед по освоению Солнечной системы, а не шагом назад. И я надеюсь, что станция после нашего полета будет лучше. И она будет ждать следующих астронавтов, космонавтов. И я надеюсь, пока мы будем летать, сейчас мы договорились летать до 2024 года, но я надеюсь, что можно помечтать, что во время нашего полета это продлится, это будет еще дальше, потому что станция нужна. И как оказалось, что в последнее время даже, ну, во-первых, мы не должны допустить никакой политики на станцию и полететь туда друзьями быть там еще дружбу закрепить вернуться друзьями и так получается что сейчас у нас станция получается единственное мирное место между нашими странами и сейчас ладно пауза um, thank you very much for your question um, it is uh, we're looking forward to very good and very beneficial work on the station beneficial to everyone involved uh, we are hoping to make our teachers and instructors very proud of the results of our work on board of the station we're hoping our, our work on the station will be a step forward uh, to the exploration of the solar system and in no way a step back uh, we're hoping that the station after our uh, work on board is going to be improved considerably and continue working for years to come. Currently, the uh, station operations have been extended to 2024, and we're hoping that after our mission, it will be extended even further uh, to later years because we all need the station. Another point, no politics are allowed on the ISS. Um, 
We're hoping that we're going to the station as friends and we're hoping to ex enhance and strengthen our friendship while we're there. The station at the moment is the one place where um, the U.S. and Russia work um, consistently well together. Да, если мы и мы должны сделать так, чтобы станция стала отправной точкой для нормализации отношений между нашими странами, чтобы наши правители, политики посмотрели, что мы можем существовать вместе очень мирно, и наши самые главные ценности это все-таки семья и мир в нашем доме. Um, and we also would like to make sure that the ISS is going to be a good starting point uh, for the improvement of relationships between Russia and the U.S. Um, so that the um, leaders of our countries can see that Russians and Americans can work very well together and can coexist uh, and achieve great things. Um, we uh, believe our values, uh, family and peace uh, all over the world are consistently our um, common priorities. Да, еще я жду, чтобы мы сохранили там здоровье, и чтобы и у Дрю, и у Рики, и, может быть, и у меня хватило бы силы здоровья слетать еще раз, и не один раз. Great, thank you, and I'm so glad you pointed out um, the international aspect. Of course, we have two Americans and a Russian here on this crew. Um, later during their mission, Alex Gerst, a German, will be joining them, um, and so it's definitely an international crew up there, and they all work together. All right, now we'll start taking questions for the crew. We'll take questions here in the room and then on the phone and then also on social media. If you have a question and you want to ask on social media, please do so using the hashtag AskNASA. Um, if you're on the phone, then please press star one if you have a question or star two to withdraw your question if it's already been answered. And just a reminder, please state your name and affiliation before you ask a question. You'll be allowed one question and a follow-up. So let's go ahead and start in the room here. Who has a question for any of the crew up here? We have one over here. And if you'll just wait one moment for a mic, sorry. <laughs> there you go. Third time's a charm. <laughs> um, Drew, uh, you'd shared your um, some photos of your SIM training in the Soyuz in Russia. Um, I was wondering if Oleg, um, if you could share your perspective of training with your two um, colleagues, and then the two of you, if you would share what it was like training for you, because I know it was a, a lot, about four-hour training session. Um, I guess Oleg, you you can start maybe, and then we'll we'll follow up. <laughs> <laughs> Ты командир станции, ты начинаешь. Okay, okay. Well, you are the commander of the Soyuz. <laughs> I guess I, I just want to say that for me, um, we have three seats in the Soyuz. The center seat is reserved for Oleg. He's the commander. The left seat is uh, fortunately or unfortunately reserved for me and the right seat for Ricky. And the, the left seat becomes like the co-pilot seat. So um, I work a lot with, with Oleg in operating the spacecraft, and Ricky supports both of us during the different phases of flight. But I can tell you from a personal standpoint, it's been really difficult. I mean, it's hard to train over there. Uh, the space flight is complex and requires a lot of interaction, especially when the simulation team is generating malfunctions for us. We're constantly having to fight that battle to keep the spacecraft moving in the direction that we want it to towards the space station. And um, so for Oleg and, I, Oleg and I, it's challenging to communicate because there's a language barrier. And of course, the, um, all of the documents that we read as uh, US crew members is in Russian. And uh, I'll, I'll be the first to admit that my Russian is not perfect. And uh, so it's, it's challenging, it's tough, and it's, it's been hard all the, you know, this over the last year to, uh, to become effective um, and functional together in the cockpit. And I, I think we've reached a balance now between the three of us where we understand enough of what is desired and required um, not only from each other but from the spacecraft to keep it operating that we've been, um, knock on wood, largely successful in our simulations. And uh, that will, of course, bode well for flight and we'll hope for a nominal launch and rendezvous and uh, 
typically what happens is we train failures for a year and a half, and then, uh, and then everything goes nice and smoothly. So that's my perspective. Well, do you have any comments? <laughs> Да, я согласен с Дрю, все он очень правильно говорит, и мы пришли на подготовку, будучи алмазами, но не обработанными, и в процессе подготовок, тренировки мы притерлись друг к другу, и у нас остался еще заключительный этап перед стартом, когда нас уже вставят в эту оправу под названием капсула, и у нас все будет хорошо, и мы, я полностью доверяю своим товарищам, и Дрю, и Рике, и я уверен, что если что-то у нас будет, какая-то нештатная ситуация или еще что-то, то мы всегда друг друга поддержим, заменим и выполним программу полета. Я в этом уверен. Yes, I completely agree with Drew. Uh, you see, when we started training, we were uh, similar to uncut diamonds. We were precious, but not fully ready to be used. So we were properly polished during training, and all that remains to be done is insert us uh, into a setting uh, that will be our capsule, and everything will go uh, well after that. I fully trust my uh, crewmates, Drew and Ricky, and I believe in any phenomenal situation, we'll be able to step in and help each other and completely rely on each other. Very good. Do we have another question here in the room? We have one back there. Steph Schrader, I break for Jalopnik. Um, so obviously I've got a question about the cars. Um, did you have any idea when you were going to community college and working as an auto mechanic that um, you would end up as an astronaut? Like, was that part of your career trajectory? And kind of how did that big break happen from going from wrenching on cars and racing on the side to, you know, this is something they want on the space station? Um, it's a great question. I, uh, I think I, when I was growing up, you know, I watched a lot of television shows, you know, Lost in Space, I grew up with, the Flintstones, you know, and I, I always, and the, and the Jetsons, but <laughs> well, it's, it's a good point Ricky makes is that I tell a lot of people on the program that uh, we all think we're George Jetson, but really in the space program, we're sort of like Fred Flintstone, yeah. you know, we're just getting started, but, um, I grew up watching those shows, and so I was always interested in space and exploration. I just believed I would, ha I would someday, I thought all of us would just be working in space and the space industry as we matured in our careers. And I clearly didn't do anything specifically in terms of education and early work experiences that were with the intent on becoming an astronaut, because most people who do those things you know, think about being a scientist right away, or they want to be a jet pilot. And, and, uh, and go and work in the space industry. So for me, it was just, I found the things that I liked and the things that I was good at, and those were the things I pursued. And I was, uh, I enjoyed working with my hands. I enjoyed fixing, um, you know, mechanical things, and I enjoyed racing. So that's what I did. And those things just eventually led me down a path. Um, at some point, I had to pick between automotive design and science, and I chose science, but I was able to take all that those mechanical aptitude skills with me, and they've served me well. I have four projects in the garage right now. I mean, I always have projects going on, but I think of it as currency training. You know, it's what makes me better at my job here at NASA. It really has been a, a great skill to have. It's always good to have a friend who's an auto mechanic, too. Yeah. Eh? <laughs> You've been over to the house a few times. <laughs> and I get free beer. <laughs> great. Do we have any more questions here in the room? Have a couple more? Hi, my name is Kip Lank, and I represent the RPM Foundation. Okay. And um, I know with your uh, the training going on between uh, you guys and, and Oleg, my favorite Russian uh, phrase is Yani Pani Mayu. And I'm sure that you've used that many times in your training, which means I do not understand. So the question is I have is, as your training is co-pilot, basically, of the Soyuz, I'm sure you use that many times over. But have you put Oleg in the other seat and shown him some of the uh, time around the track and your experience with automobiles? Um, we haven't yet, but I'll I'll do the Yane Pani Mayu one better. We we sometimes say Yane Pani Delnik, which means I'm not I'm not Monday, right? Which <laughs> which even proves we understand less. But um, uh, you know we we haven't. Oleg's been over to the house, and and you know we've been we stand around in the garage just like people with you know that have a garage full of cars do. They bring people over and stand around and you know stare at the cars for a bit, and then everybody wanders back inside and has their dinner party. But um, I hope that uh, post-flight we'll have some opportunities to do some neat things around the world and share some experiences together. And I hope that some of those experiences 
uh, include visits to races or tracks or something like that so that all of the crew members can see some of the um, behind the scenes experiences that I've seen as a race enthusiast and a, and a mechanic. Absolutely. After their mission, these guys get a couple months to basically go around and tell people about their mission um, post flight appearances. So that's a great opportunity. All right, another question here in the room. I'm Dina Ayash from University of Houston downtown. And this isn't quite about cars, it's education related. But I was wondering, what advice would you give to any students who are interested in becoming an astronaut? You got that, buddy. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> study math and science. Uh, I, I think Drew hit on something. It, it, it's, a, it's a physically demanding job, it's a mentally demanding job, and it requires you to be able to fix and repair things. Um, so uh, y you cannot be a one-dimensional person. I think most of the folks in, that, that fly in space, um, they exhibit a tenacity, they exhibit a, a willingness to take constructive criticism and try to improve, and then they definitely have a sense of humor to laugh at the first two things, both about themselves and um, the situations they get themselves into. But really being well-rounded um, and, and good at what you do. Uh, and, and it's required, of course, to have a background in science, math, engineering um, to, to get that, the foot in the door. But I, I want to just uh, emphasize that, you know, for me and, and a, actually a handful of astronauts in the core, many of us started out at community college. Yeah. And that's not a bad way to start an education. Um, it's served me well. It, I, I think there's on the order of 10 or 12 astronauts that have started in community college. So um, students shouldn't be um, afraid or discouraged by start, you know, not going straight to university, but looking at all their options, exploring possibilities, finding the thing that they're good at, and then going off to pursue those things uh, for higher education. I think that's critical. Yeah. That's a great question. All right, I think we have a couple more. Right here. Uh, hi, Melissa from UHD as well. Um, we're all very curious, Ricky, what was the passion or desire that pulled you out of the classroom that made you decide that, that you wanted to go on this, uh, what we understand to be a fairly lengthy process to actually become uh, an astronaut? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question, thanks. Um, I was always interested in, in space exploration, ocean exploration when I was a kid. Uh, I think my desire to learn is what ultimately drove me into a, a, a job with, in teaching, to be able to work alongside students and, and learn together. Uh, my, I never had one school year that was like the previous one uh, because there was always something new you could be doing. And, um, and while teaching, I was able to pursue those interests in both space science and in, in oceanography and in marine science, uh, along with my students. And the more interest that I got in the history of space exploration um, and the technology behind it and the things we were doing, um, I, I kind of thought, well, that, well that's something I, I wouldn't mind looking into. And, and certainly, um, the Krista McAuliffe and the Challenger mission and Barb Morgan, who followed in her footsteps, uh, gave me an idea that there might be an opportunity to, to come and join, join this program. Uh, and when the time came and I saw uh, the advertisement that NASA is looking to recruit astronauts, I said, well, I, I, I kind of owe it to myself to at least try. It'd be a really, really awesome rejection letter to have framed in my office <laughs> to, say I, to say I threw my name in. And, um, and I was lucky and fortunate enough to end up here and to be, to be a part of this team. Very cool. All right, next question. My name's Leo. Uh, I go to UHD as well. Uh, I got a question for Ricky. What's your philosophy on teaching? I think a, a lot of what we learn, we learn by doing. Um, and I think uh, if you can in, uh, inspire children uh, to follow the things they're interested in that Drew, that Drew, Drew was uh, mentioning, to inspire, help them find out what they're interested in, what their passions are, and then encourage the critical thinking uh, that requires those, the students to be successful. Um, that to me is the foundation of education. You, 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 critical thinking and analysis and problem solving are the, the, the key skills that we need to be a, to be a functioning society and for, for students to be, uh, to be functional members of society. So I think, I think our instruction should be geared toward that. Unfortunately, we're, we're, you guys, as you know, and my wife's still in, in education, I worked in education for a long time, a lot of my friends still work in education. 
um, the, the environment is such that, that, that that's challenging because so much is being prescribed. Uh, so I would encourage you guys to you know, do the job that's required of you, but if the, the kids are ultimately able to regurgitate information rather than process it, then we're failing. Um, uh, we, we need kids to be able to look at the world, take data in, process it, and make, make informed decisions about what's actually going on around them. If they don't leave school with that skill, we're, we're missing something. Great. All right, we have another question over here. I think I'll sit. Hi, I'm Ruth Keenan. I'm with um, Keels and Wheels and also San Jacinto College Foundation. And uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for all of your support for community colleges, especially for the automotive and the, all of the skills, the math and science and the STEM. Um, it, it's very inspirational to be here. I want to ask, are you fearless? But I could ask it, how do you develop your confidence? Or obviously, you have a growth mindset and not a fixed mindset. Obviously, there's got to be some kind of fear in there, and how do you deal with that? You want to take tackle that yeah, one? Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> I think everybody has their own philosophy. I'll, I'll say that, um, you know, fear is healthy for us, and um, understanding what the risk is is important for us. Um, we don't we don't take our jobs lightly and we don't go into the, the work that we do haphazardly. And we've all had, I know I've had a few interesting moments in space that caught my attention. And also in daily work, you know, over the last 18 years as an astronaut in the work that we do, some, you know, things that happen that sort of get your attention and make you realize that, that what we do is, can be risky business. Um, but I think what makes us uh, effective, the most effective, and it's a model that the military uses, is repetition. You know, we train so much repetition into the work that we do that even when you're faced with a challenging event or situation, like you've heard it before in other organizations, the training kicks in and your mind just starts operating to respond to it just the way that you've prepared to. And you don't think about the other risks. Um, you don't think about what's going on around you. You just think about what you've been trained to do and what you, the way you've been trained to respond. And that's really all you can do. Um, you know, when you're sitting on the rocket and the countdown is getting down to zero, it's too late to change your mind. And <laughs> and I don't know about Ricky, probably Oleg as well. We all at some point as the countdown's getting close think, you know, why am I sitting on top of rocket fuel right now? But you know that there's nothing you can do. And it's you're just going to, you know, someone's going to push the button and the next eight minutes will either be successful or they won't. And this is just where you found yourself in life at that point in time. There's not much you can do about it. I think all of us believe that what we're doing is really important. And uh, I, I, I know walking out to the, to the shuttle, you, you've surrendered to the madness at that point. Yeah. You know, you, at that point, your faith's in the system and the people there who are, who've made it all possible. And your mission is significant enough and important enough that, uh, that the risk that you're accepting is that the, the objectives of the mission are, are such that the risks are, you know, are worth it. So I, I like, what's your... What was your experience launching? How did you feel as you got on the rocket and the countdown was approaching zero? Ну, я не помню, чтобы я сильно волновался. Но вот если бы я не не был космонавтом, а шел бы просто по улице, и тут меня схватили бы стартовая команда, посадила бы в ракету и запустила. Я бы запомнил это на всю жизнь, наверное. Это было бы очень страшно, наверное. Um, I, don't, I don't remember being particularly worried about it, but you see, if I were uh, not a cosmonaut but an ordinary person walking down the street and the launch uh, team would have grabbed me off the street, stuffed me in the rocket, and the countdown started, I would probably be very scared. I would have remembered that moment for the rest of my life. Yeah. <laughs> Но когда ты готовишься годами, вот у меня к первому полету я готовился 11 лет, и ты знаешь каждый шаг, шаг за шагом, что будет происходить, поэтому ты думаешь только о том, лишь бы тебя не подвела техника, лишь бы не подвело здоровье твое, лишь бы ты не подвело здоровье твоих товарищей, и тогда будет все хорошо. Если техника и здоровье экипажа будет все нормально, то будет все хорошо. Но и наша ракета «Союз», она сделана так, что она спасает человека на любом этапе. И, если только, конечно, не вмешается человеческий фактор, но чтобы он не вмешался, нас этому обучают. 
Uh, but you see, when you train uh, for years, and I personally spent 11 years training for my first flight, you know, this process step by step, and um, you think along the way that unless there are some health problems uh, or if the technical components are uh, going to fail or uh, your crewmates' health problems might uh, throw a wrench in the works, but otherwise, you know, the step, uh, all the steps along the way. And the uh, Soyuz vehicle uh, is designed in such a way it can rescue the crew at any uh, stage uh, in the launch process unless there is a human error. And in order to avoid human error, um, that is what our training process is for. Да, и есть у нас специальная, к сожалению, у астронавтов нет такой подготовки, а у российских космонавтов есть. Это специальная парашютная подготовка космонавтов. Unfortunately, the U.S. astronauts do not have that component of training, but the Russian cosmonauts um, undergo parachute uh, training component. Да, это подготовка понижает страх и уровень страха у человека, потому что когда ты первый раз приезжаешь на эту парашютную подготовку, она непростая. У человека, у каждому раздается задание, которое есть задача на руке, и потом тебя просто выкидывают из самолета, вот, толчком в лоб. Ты должен застабилизироваться, и потом есть специальный микрофон, шлем, ты должен открыть задачу и решить ее. И когда это первый раз, то потом психолог может услышать только два слова. Ой, ай, и все. А когда с каждым прыжком э, все человек становится спокойным, разумным, и ведет репортаж, решает задачи, и вот так постепенно убивается страх у человека. I see uh, the training is designed to reduce the uh, fear level in uh, crew members. It's not easy. You arrive at the uh, uh, parachute pad at the, uh, and you're handed a problem to solve. It's in your hands and then you go up um, and they push you out of the uh, uh, flight vehicle. Yeah, they, you have the goal of stabilizing yourself while you're uh, on the parachute. You have a uh, helmet and the microphone in the helmet, and you have the pro problem in your hand that you need to solve the first time. The psychologist uh, who monitors your flight here is just uh, oik and uh, ikes and uh, oops. Mm -hmm. And then as you progress through the training, you're able to provide the writing commentary of your flight. You're able to work out the problem. And slowly, step by step, the fear level is reduced, and that is um, the goal of the training. Да, и это все делается до открытия парашюта. То есть ты должен решить задачу и только потом открыть парашют. And you see, that is all done prior to the parachute opening. That you need to solve that problem prior to opening your parachute. You're not trying to tell us you have a parachute and we don't. <laughs> 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 question. <laughs> All right, now we're going to go to the phone bridge. Um, Bill Harwood from CBS News. Uh, yes, hi. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Hey, Bill. Thanks. Um, I have two very quick questions, one for Drew and one for uh, Ricky. Uh, Drew, you mentioned the difficulty of training in a second language in general. Maybe talk a little bit about it. I'm always curious how the left seater, how tough it is to train for abort uh, various emergency scenarios, you know, when it's not your language. Um, Give me a sense of how that went for you. Uh, thanks for the question, Bill, and thanks for calling in. Um, you know, it's that's most of what we do now in the Soyuz. We, we of course, spent uh, the better part of a year learning about the technical systems um, in the in the spacecraft. And now, over the last several months, we've just been in the simulators, and all we do is train for the abort scenarios or the um, you know the malfunctions going uphill, and and to be honest, the uh, the launch abort uh, process in the Soyuz is is basically automatic, and we're pretty much hands off. So, in that in that respect, uh, there's not a lot we can do once the abort sequence starts, as long as we're not to a point in the launch stage where we're going to you know abort once around or, or head into uh, head into orbit. So. From that perspective, there's not much we can do. Most of what we focus on is uh, failures of burns, uh, in particular the deorbit burn, which is critical for us. Um, we do a lot of work uh, 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 training for that that sort of response. And then uh, on the way uphill, most of the failures are, are more minor um, once we're in orbit because the spacecraft really is a, a very robust design with a lot of redundant systems. And uh, we have time once we make it to orbit to, uh, to deal with any of the failures. So, um, 
a short answer is for launch aborts, uh, it's fairly straightforward. We just uh, snuggle in and uh, keep our fingers crossed and watch the system respond. Um, the real critical uh, component for us is uh, rendezvous phase failures and then uh, deorbit, uh, deorbit burns, undocking and deorbit. And of course, all of that ties in, most of the undocking aspect ties in with any emergencies on, on uh, space stations. So those are common to US and Russian segment. Uh, training for those uh, events and then eventually transitioning to uh, to the Soyuz where you'd have to leave this the uh, station to come home So pretty straightforward we use a Does that sound straightforward? I don't know. <laughs> we use a rather small vocabulary. I mean, to, you yeah. know, there's, there's only certain words, we're, and we're also anchored probably uh, an awful lot in the procedures, yeah. which is, it's, it's, it's not like reading a, a Pushkin or, or Tolstoy. Um, your yeah. voca the vocabulary required is, is relatively small, and so we really need to make sure we can understand those words and, and then operate within that, within that vocabulary to, to execute yeah. the, the more challenging stuff. Thanks, and, and, and a real quick question for Ricky. Um, sure. And I apologize for this. You may have already addressed it, and I didn't realize that the room mic down there is not working, so I can barely hear when what the questions are that are being asked. But what, do you, what specifically do you plan in an education sense? Um, or is there anything? It's just being there um, enough to show how far a career in education can carry someone, or do you have any actual events planned? And that's it for me. Thanks. No, that's a great question, Bill. Thank you. And uh, the... As you know, Joe's on, Joe Acaba is on orbit. He's uh, also was a teacher. Um, he came into the into the NASA with me and Dorothy uh, Metcalf Lindenberger, Dottie, and Barb Morgan was here. But Joe's been up there, and by coincidence, Joe and I will be back to back for for almost a, an entire year in space. And so NASA is uh, rolled out this year of education on station. Uh, there's going to be you're going to hear more about it today on Facebook Live here shortly. Um, but we are. Because we have more USOS crew members on board, we've had more time to do downlinks with schools uh, and museums and, and other groups. Uh, and we're also utilizing the space station as a platform uh, to, to demonstrate some of, some of the principles that, that these fine folks here and teachers around the country and around the world can use to, uh, to, to educate kid, kids about STEM using the space station as a platform. So. Uh, We'll talk about it a little bit later. Joe has his first uh, demonstration or demonstration coming out. Uh, I think it's later today. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's more to follow. I know Mark Vandehei has been working on them. I think Randy Bresnik has done mm -hmm. one. And we'll continue with that. It's just not about Joe and I. It's about everyone up there and this wonderful platform we have for science, exploration, and education. That's right. Thank you. All right. Now we'll go over to social media. If you have a question on social media, please um, use the hashtag ask NASA to ask. We have Haley in the room to look in for those questions. Haley? So the first question is um, technically ad addressed to Drew from the American Speech, Language, and Hearing Association, but I think anyone can answer. How important is communication during a space mission? How is it used? That is a great question, and uh, I'm glad that the, uh, the American Speech, Language, and Hearing Association has sort of checked in to, uh, to ask us about that. We, and I think we just talked about a little bit with, with uh, Bill's question about uh, language and the spacecraft and how we communicate, and um, communication is critical for us in all of our operations. Obviously, mission control supporting us from the ground and the crew working together in space um, without the ability to communicate and really refine our communication skills, uh, none of what we do would be possible and, and it would never have been possible, I think, throughout the entire space program. So, of course, communication is critical day to day for all of us. And, um, I mean, that's just how we operate as humans. We, we talk and, and we also use body language and we use sign language and we use uh, many means of communication to get a message across. But that's how we interact as a species. And so communication is key, and it's key for us in the spacecraft and uh, throughout all the operations that we do. One of the really fascinating things is the, the uh, part of this is the cross-cultural communication required on the International Space Station. When we're up there, we'll have Alex Gerst to German. Um, uh, Nemo is going to be waiting for us when we get there. We have Rus our Russian colleagues. And uh, we all come from different backgrounds, different places, and yet we go up and operate this really complex vehicle. And we live together for a long period of time. So we really need to understand what motivates people, what from a certain country or a certain culture, uh, what, what, what 
is meaningful to them, what's important to them, and, and that you're sensitive to, to their needs as, a, as an individual and as a member of a different culture than yours. Great. Another question from social media? Yeah, so this one is um, also, I think, plays on Drew's interest, but a good chance for anyone to talk about their hobbies. Um, this is from the U.S. Tennis Association, and they said, we heard that Drew loves tennis. Can you tell us how you plan to spend your leisure time on the space station? It's a very small court. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Tennis is uh, tennis is one of my loves. Uh, um, actually, tennis is because of my love. I, tennis came into my life uh, later after I met my wife, and uh, she comes from a huge tennis playing family, and that, uh, that those experiences and those interests rubbed off on me and our kids, and uh, um, we certainly enjoy. As much as I enjoy watching races uh, on TV or attending those, we certainly enjoy the same when it comes to tennis and uh, tennis events, of course, here, not only here in Houston, um, but also uh, around the world. So um, we, we might, uh, you know, we'll see if there's any surprises on orbit, but uh, we're looking forward to some opportunities. You guys don't know it yet, but maybe we'll get to play some tennis in space. <laughs> Awesome. All right. And since we haven't really talked about it too much yet, I want to ask, of course, science besides, you know, our education initiatives and the maintenance that you talked about, um, science is really going to be your main job on the space station and um, the main purpose. I know you touched on utilization a little bit earlier, um, and most of your day is going to contain um, hundreds of science experiments throughout the mission. So I was wondering if each of you could tell us a little bit about the science you'll be doing, maybe an experiment you're excited for. That, yeah, it's a great comment, and uh, you know we're talking about outside interests and our sort of some of our hobbies, and some some of our backgrounds, um, but really the space station is a platform for science, and um, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of experiments that go on that have been going on to the space uh, on board the space station since uh, we launched it in uh, really in 1998, and uh, as scientists. All of us, um, look, we are all looking forward to you know, carrying out that research day to day. We really become the hands and eyes and ears of the researchers. And it's rare for an astronaut to design an experiment or design equipment that goes to space. It does happen. But for the most part, we are there every day to make sure that the equipment operates properly and that we can execute the science experiments um, as we see fit. There's a lot of exciting things happening on ISS. Uh, the plan is always changing. Um, some of that's dependent on uh, what spacecraft are coming up. You know, supply ships are coming up, um, but but we are uh, we are going to ex be exposed to many different size experiments, and uh, I would probably fail in in attempt to explain what those are in particular and uh, how many of those we're going to see. Because literally, the plan does change, but but we we learn about something new almost every day that we're here uh, getting ready for space uh, in order to carry those out. I don't know if there's, I know that there's some, uh, there's some Earth, uh, uh, Earth observing science missions that are going on, and we have some uh, components that's capable of that, a lot of uh, cell research, uh, material science, those sorts of things. So um, every day is going to be different. It's going to be a new adventure, and, but our job is to uh, make sure the equipment works properly and that the data gets recorded and we can send it back to Earth and be the, be the hands of the researchers. Great. Thanks. Ricky? Um, yeah, one part of the, of the science uh, program that I think all of us are interested in is we are we are test subjects while we're there. So how how do our bodies change from spending a long uh, period of time on, on orbit? So uh, I think um, it'll be interesting to be part of that. The data collection is interesting, yeah. and uh, to get back and see see some of the things and the changes some of the changes that happen. Because ultimately, if we are going to be a, a multiplanetary species, which I believe we will be. We're going to have to figure some of these things out and figure out how do humans change, how can we mitigate some of those changes, and, um, and, uh, and, or, and, if, and how, how we can deal and protect astronauts for, for long duration, duration missions in space. Um, the second piece, and this is by no means, uh, the, the, it just happens that I, so happens that I had this class yesterday. So I've had a lot of really interesting classes on uh, the types of projects we're doing. And I saw Oleg in there today, the, the combustion chamber that we use for trying to develop cleaner ways to burn fuel, uh, better, uh, better rocket uh, propulsion design. I came here with really no understanding when I came to NASA of how really even rockets and rocket engines work. And, but if we're going to go to other planets, um, we, we need to figure out a way to get there quickly. And so some of the science we will be doing directly on the space station will help that, help that endeavor. 
but it'll also help us design cleaner burning engines and better ways to burn fuel here, here on Earth. And I, I thought that was a really interesting uh, uh, experiment that we will all take, take part in when we're there. Oleg, do you want to touch on the science you'll be doing? You were in that class this morning, so I took the most current one from <laughs> you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Да, я согласен и с Рики, и с Дрю, но хочу сказать, что самые любимые эксперименты по опыту моему, моего первого полета это те эксперименты, которые так называемые мультисегментные. Это те эксперименты, где участвуют и американские астронавты, и российские космонавты. Это эксперименты, например, сферс, ну, сферы, и эксперимент Эрскакам, и... Вот этот культурный обмен идет вот очень э, сильнее, когда мы работаем вместе в этой лаборатории. И я за то, чтобы этих экспериментов было как можно больше, вот этих мультисегментных. Так, ну сейчас подождем, да, переведем. I agree with Rick and Drew, and I should say that my favorite experiments are uh, those we would call multi-element experiments that involve both the, the Russian and the American crew members, such as experiment called Spheres, experiment called EarthCam. I believe uh, during joint work, uh, the cultural exchange is intensified, and I, I'm looking forward to having as many of these type of experiments on board as possible. Да, и мы можем, благодаря вот этим экспериментам, мы можем работать и с учеными, и с американскими учеными, и с учеными российскими учеными. То есть это очень здорово, когда есть микс э, науки и американской, и российской. Это раз. Во-вторых, ну вот мне нравятся те эксперименты научные, которые у нас проходят за бортом станции при внекорабельной деятельности. Вот у нас очень интересные эксперименты. Это э, у нас будет выход э, э, «Икарус». Очень интересный эксперимент, который позволит определять и мониторировать птиц, перелетных птиц, и понимать, как вот инфекционные заболевания распространяются по миру, как это будет играть на роль безопасности полетов, вот эти миграции птиц. Это вот мы будем устанавливать эту антенну. И еще очень хороший эксперимент – тест которые позволят нам определить границу нашей биосферы. Вы знаете, что этот эксперимент мы и в моем полете делались, и во многих полетах вот ближе, последние пять лет мы поняли, что на поверхности станции есть своя атмосфера, есть свои микроорганизмы, которые живут, несмотря на то, что там есть невесомость и вакуум. Um, also, uh, thanks to the experiments, uh, we get to work uh, with both the U.S. and Russian scientists, and such a mix uh, is a very uh, interesting and very educational for us as well. Another group of experiments I like very much uh, are EVA experiments we perform uh, during extravehicular activity outside of the station. One of the experiments we're going to uh, perform is going to be called ICARS, um, that is studying the uh, spread of infectious diseases when we install the antenna to monitor bird migration and how the diseases are uh, spread around the world. Another experiment um, is called TEST. Uh, it is biosphere research experiment. Um, several years ago we realized that there is a uh, um, an entire environment that exists outside of the station on the surface, exterior surface of the station. That there are microorganisms that survive even in vacuum, and that's another um, research that we could perform to study those uh, microorganisms. Perfect, thank you. All right, we're done with questions. We have one more topic to cover before we wrap up, and it's related to the year of education we've been talking about and the demonstrations that Ricky mentioned earlier. So Ricky, can you introduce our video? Yeah, as I was uh, talking about earlier, uh, my former crewmate who flew with me on STS-119 and my classmate uh, who came to NASA at the same time I did, NASA fellow educators up on space station right now, his name's Joe Acaba. And uh, he is going to, uh, he has put together a, a brief demonstration um, uh, surrounding exercise and exercise equipment. We spend a lot of time exercising in space. It's critical for our health. Uh, it's not as easy as here on Earth because of the absence of working in microgravity. You can't just go lift weights. You can lift any amount of weight you want when it doesn't weigh anything. So uh, Joe's put together a small uh, demonstration. If you go to STEM on Station website, there will be lesson plans uh, available with it. And, um, and these are, there'll be more of these following uh, throughout the course of the, this increment and the follow-on increments up until 
I leave, and then they'll continue even after that. So I'm very excited about that, and I think it'll be a great resource for, for educators around the world. So if we can roll that. Let's take a look at how astronauts exercise in space. This machine here is the Advanced Resistive Exercise Device, or we call it AREG. It simulates free weight exercises in normal gravity to work all the major muscle groups. AREG's primary goal is to maintain our muscle strength and mass so that we have less of a recovery period when we land back on Earth. All right, so there's looking at lifting. But what about a little cardio? We have a treadmill for that. Let's check it out. Staying physically active. Awesome. All right. Well, that's all the time we have. Thank you, everyone, for being part of the um, Crew News Conference today. Don't forget to watch these guys launch. They're launching March 9th, um, 422 p.m. Central Time. You can watch them launch on NASA TV, online at nasa.gov slash live, and also on Facebook Live on the International Space Station Facebook page. Um, you can also follow them throughout their whole mission as they send updates from space um, through social media on Instagram and Twitter. Um, Drew is at Astro underscore Foistel. Ricky is at Astro underscore Ricky. And Oleg is at, at, at Oleg MKS. Um, and you can follow the space station also on social media uh, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And find out more about it on nasa.gov slash station. Thanks.